All right, hey guys, today we're going to be going over chapter 10. So we're going to be discussing airway management, artificial ventilation, and how do we oxygenate our patients. So in this chapter, we're going to go uh, review our respiratory system, um, go over what respiration is, how do we assess an airway, as well as assessing breathing, what is adequate, ventila adequate breathing, and what is inadequate breathing, and how to decide whether or not we have to assist in our patient's ventilation. We're also going to cover uh, how do we co provide artificial ventilation, uh, some considerations in management and ventilations, uh, go over various types of oxygen therapy, as well as, and then we'll summarize everything once we get to the end. All right, so by understanding the mechanical and physiological processes of respiration and ventilation, and the various ways to assist patients with artificial ventilation, you will be able to quickly initiate and maintain an adequate airway and oxygenation in cases of emergency. So respiration is the actual gas exchange that occurs at that alveolar capillary level. Um, so that, that way so oxygen can be given into the bloodstream, then perfused through to the body cells and the adjacent capillaries. So there are four components that make up our ventilation. The first being pulmonary ventilation or simple ventilation or just simply breathing is the actual mechanical process of moving air in and out of the lungs. It is thus related to minute ventilation and alveolar ventilation which will be discussed later. External respiration is the gas exchange process that occurs between the alveoli and the surrounding pulmonary capillaries. External respiration, also referred to as alveoli capillary gas exchange, serves to oxygenate the blood and eliminate carbon dioxide within the lungs. Internal respiration is the gas exchange process that occurs between the cells and the systemic capillaries. Internal respiration, also known as cell capillary gas exchange, is responsible for delivering oxygen to the cells and removing carbon dioxide from the cell. Cellular respiration and metabolism, also known as aerobic metabolism, occurs within the cell. This process breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen, thus producing high amounts of energy in the form of ATP, and then releasing carbon dioxide and water as a byproduct. Within your upper airway, you have air entering the body through the nostrils, normally. It is then warmed, moistened, and filtered as it flows over the damp, sticky mucous membranes that line the nose. Air then enters, entering through the body, through the mouth and nostrils, then travels into the pharynx. The trachea is the passageway for air traveling into the lungs. The epiglottis serves as a valve that closes over the opening to the larynx while food and drink are being swallowed. The larynx, or the voice cord, excuse me, voice box, contains the vocal cords, which is made up of the anterior portion of the larynx, uh, commonly known as the at, which is commonly known as the ap Adam's apple, which can be felt at the front of the throat. The cricoid cartilage forms the most inferior portion of the larynx and is the only completely circular cartilaginous ring of the upper airway. So you breathe in air through the nasal cavity. You have turbinates that help spin the air and help warm it up, as well as you have your mucous membranes within that starts uh, moistening that air and humidifying it. Same process if it comes to the mouth. The only thing is it doesn't get humidified as it comes through. Air then goes down through the pharynx to where the epiglottis is, which would be right about here, and it then comes down into the trachea and down into the vocal into the lungs, which on the back side you have the esophagus. Within the larynx, this is the Adam's apple, you have your hyoid bone, which this bone is specifically is very difficult to break. The only way, this is how a lot of times they figure out, determine whether or not someone has been strangled or hanged. 
um, because that is how the hyoid bone gets broken. You have your thyroid cartilage, your trachea, cricoid cartilage. All of this makes up your larynx, your vocal cords. And if you, in fact, if you go on to paramedic school, you will actually learn more about this and actually be able to. And you'll this will actually some parts of this will be your landmarks in part of intubation. Within your lower airway, this is extending everything from the cricoid cartilage all the way down to the alveoli. Your trachea, which is commonly known as the windpipe, is the passageway for air entering into the lungs. Uh, it extends from the larynx to the carina, which is the point at which the trachea splits into the right and left main stem bronchi. You have then there's the right and left main stem bronchi, which are the two major branches of the trachea, which extend from the carina into the lungs, where they continue to divide into smaller sections or branches known as bronchioles. Your bronchioles then differentiate into millions of tiny air sacs within the lungs. These are called the alveoli. The visceral pleura is the innermost covering of the lung. The parietal pleura is a thicker, more uh, elastic layer that adheres to the inner portion of the chest wall. Between the two layers is the pleural space, which is a small space that is at negative pressure. The pleural space also contains a small amount of serous fluid that acts as a lubricant to uh, reduce friction when the layers of the pleura rub against each other during breathing. So, uh, let's see. All right. So here's the larynx. So at this point is when it breaks off from the upper to the lower airway. So it comes down the trachea to the right left main stem bronchi. Here, so here's your carina here. Okay, then it goes down and it continues breaking down until you get into the alveoli. When you inhale, this is what's considered a active process. This draws the air by way of the nose, mouth, trachea, bronchi into the lungs until the pressure into the lungs is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the body. Inhalation is an active process because it requires energy to contract the muscles. So y'all remember when we discussed previously when you take a breath in, you cause that uh, negative pressure change within the chest as the chest cavity increases. Okay, Diaphragm contracts and lowers. Thus, the chest cavity increases, you get that negative pressure, air is then drawn into the chest. Whereas exhalation would be considered a passive process as you exhale air. In some respiratory diseases affecting the lower airway, such as asthma, the patient can have a difficult time moving air out of the lungs because of an increased resistance in the airways or to deceased, excuse me, diseased lung tissue. There is a loss of the elastic recoil of the chest wall and lungs because air is trapped in the alveoli. Therefore, the patient must contract muscles not only to draw air into the lungs, but also to force air out of the lungs. Therefore, both inhalation and exhalation becomes active in those with some type of respiratory disease. Oh, give me one second. There we go. All right, sorry about that. Um, now, in a normal case, if, with no respiratory disease going on whatsoever, when you take that breath in, you get that negative pressure change, then in an active process, not, I'm not having to sit there and go and force the air out. Just everything relaxes. Diaphragm relaxes, come back up. Everything decreases in size. You get a positive increase. Now, the atmospheric pressure in my chest, or the pressure in my chest is over the atmospheric pressure outside and the air is able to come out. Alright. When 
controlling your respirations, you have what's called chemoreceptors. These chemoreceptors continually monitor levels of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the pH in the arterial blood and stimulate an increase or decrease in impulses from the respiratory rhythm centers to control the rate and depth of ventilation. The respiratory system responds primarily to changes in the carbon dioxide levels. In patients with a category of conditions known as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, the carbon dioxide level in arterial blood is typically chronically elevated because of the disease process. These patients breathe on a hypoxic or low oxygen drive because they breathe to increase their oxygen levels and not to reduce their carbon dioxide levels. This can affect your management of the patient when considering oxygen therapy. And we'll discuss this more in detail later on. Oxygenation is the process by which the blood and the cells become saturated with oxygen. This happens because of internal respiration and external respiration. The processes in which fresh oxygen replaces waste, carbon dioxide, a gas exchange that takes place between the alveoli and the capillaries in the lungs and between the capillaries in the cells throughout the body. Now this typically occurs from a ventilation um, to perfusion mismatch for hypoxemia. A ventilation perfusion mismatch occurs when there is a lack of available oxygenated air in the alveoli even though perfusion to the alveoli is adequate or when the alveoli are adequately oxygenated but perfusion of the alveoli is poor or when there is a combination of both poor ventilation and poor perfusion in the alveolar capillary structures. So when you start having signs of hypoxia or oxygen not being delivered adequately to the cells, you, it can occur from multiple different things. So you need to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms that you would see in patients with hypoxia. Who can tell me what some of the signs and symptoms of mild hypoxia are, or mild to moderate? Okay, pale, cool, clammy skin, tachypnea, yep, or an increased respiratory rate, headache possibly, starting to get confused and disoriented because of, right, the high carb CO2 levels. Could have an elevation in blood pressure, yes. What about signs and symptoms of severe hypoxia? Now we're getting further along in it. Right? You, you got the cyanosis becoming more prominent. The, pa yep, the patient begins to become very sleepy. They may have dyspnea or difficulty breathing. Uh, the reaction time getting slow. Right? Head bobbing or droopy head, eyelids even seizure activity, slow reaction time. Very good, everybody. All right, so cyanosis, you want to look at your um, mucous membranes. So you can look at the conjunctiva of the eye, the lips, okay, uh, the nail beds, even the area around the lips. All right. So no matter who the person, what their ethnicity is, you can still find those signs and symptoms of cyanosis. You just got to make sure you're looking in the right spot. Um, in infants and young children, they normally have a higher heart rate than adults. As an example, a heart rate of 80, which is normal in an adult, may be an indication of hypoxia in a week old infant, where a heart rate of 100 to 180 beats per minute is normal. So it's important in the assessment of newborns to suspect hypoxia as a cause of a slower than expected heart rate, because this is a primary cause of bradycardia in this group. It is also important to assess for early signs of hypoxia. The skin will become pale, cool, and clammy early, so you may also find tachypnea and tachycardia. Early changes in the mental status may occur in the form of restlessness or agitation and confusion. Hypoxia causes uh, restlessness and agitation in the patient, whereas the buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood will cause the patient to become confused. 
If the patient displays any signs of hypoxia, immediately assess their, the airway inadequacy of breathing. If the breathing status is inadequate, either an inadequate rate or an inadequate volume, immediately begin positive pressure ventilation. Um, as you get that external respiration going on, uh, you have blood coming in and blood coming out, right? So the blood coming in, that's coming into the alveolar capillaries that is deoxygenated, has a low oxygen concentration but high carbon dioxide levels. Whereas the air that you breathe in has high oxygen, low carbon dioxide. So everything is going to go through a process called diffusion. So the blood coming in, as I said, that has no low oxygen, the high oxygen levels are now going to diffuse across the alveolar capillary membrane into the red blood cells, where the area of low concentration is, whereas the carbon dioxide at the same time is going to diffuse across that membrane into the alveoli through diffusion because there's a level of low carbon CO2 levels. And that allows the oxygen to then go through with by the hemoglobin to the body and the carbon dioxide then exhaled from the alveoli and out of the lungs. Your cells have high levels of carbon dioxide and low levels of oxygen from normal metabolism. Again, because oxygen and carbon dioxide move from areas of high concentration to those of low concentration, the oxygen moves out of the capillaries and into the cells and the carbon dioxide moves out of the cells and into the capillaries. Alright, so here you have the alveolar capillary exchange. So as you breathe in, um, oxygen moves in as CO2 moves out. Same thing at the cellular level. High CO2, high oxygen. Oxygen goes across that membrane into the tissue, whereas CO2 and the various wastes cross from the cell into the capillaries, into circulation, and eventually be taken out of the body. Um, a severe alteration in perfusion can also cause a decrease in glucose delivery to the cells. Without a fuel source, the cells fail to produce energy and eventually die. This is what happens because of when oxygen is not available, you go through anaerobic metabolism. You have that buildup of lactic acid, um, low amount of ATP being uh, created, cells begin to fail, and cells begin to die. Uh, pulmonary ventilation, this can be caused by or can be impaired by a variety of different things as well, such as interruption of the nervous system's control and stimulation of the diaphragm or of the external ex intercostal muscles may result from a brain injury or from drugs that depress the central nervous system. You can also be caused by structural damage to the thorax, which can cause an interference in the bellows action of the chest. This impedes the ability of the thorax to generate pressure changes necessary to draw air in and out of the lungs. You can also have an increased airway resistance which reduces airflow through the respiratory tract and reduces the amount of air in the alveoli. This in turn makes less oxygen available for gas exchange. You then see an increase in airway resistance can occur from bronchoconstriction or from the inflammation inside the vessel. Disruption of airway patency can occur from swelling caused by infection, allergic reaction or burns, or from trauma, uh, some type of foreign air airway obstruction or loss of muscle tone associated with an altered mental status, altered mental state, or unresponsive patient. A reduction in the oxygen content of the ambient atmosphere decreases the available oxygen for gas exchange in the alveoli and at the cells thus leading to cellular hypoxia. The oxygen content may be reduced by toxic gases or an enclosed space without adequate ventilation. Pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and even drowning causes fluid to fill the alveoli, collapsing the alveoli, or increase the space between the alveoli and the capillaries, all of which hinder the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the capillaries into the alveoli. Other diseases, such as emphysema, 
distort the structure of the alveoli and change the surface area for effective gas exchange. Another cause of cellular hypoxia is poor perfusion or a decreased ability of the blood to carry oxygen. Conditions that could obstruct forward movement of blood flow, such as a pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, heart failure, and cardiac tamponade, reduces the delivery of oxygenated blood to the cells. Other conditions such as anemia or hypovolemia uh, could potentially reduce the concentration of red blood cells and hemoglobin within the blood, thus making oxygen transport less effective. Um, when it comes to infants and children, you want to be cognizant that an early response to hypoxia in this group is bradycardia rather than tachycardia. Um, also, children's respiratory systems are significantly different from adults. Um, they are more reliant on their diaphragm and their uh, chest wall is very pliable. So when they start having respiratory issues, they get worn out very quickly. You also want to be cognizant that um, compared to that of an adult, their tongue is takes up more of the oropharynx. Okay, so their tongue is more cap more capable of um, causing an an airway obstruction. Their nose and mouth are much smaller than that of an adult. Uh, their epiglottis isn't fully shaped yet, so it's still protruding into the pharynx, so it can be obstructed as well. Also, beware that when opening up the airway, you don't want you want to be careful, because the cricoid cartilage is not as uh, rigid because it hasn't developed as much as that of an adult. So, if you open up their airway too much when doing a head tilt chin lift, you can actually cause the trachea to become pinched off. Um, let's see. Also, keep in mind that the oxygen reserves in infants and children are much smaller than that of an adult, so they have limited oxygen capabilities. So, when they have those periods of inadequate breathing or apnea, um, they're not able to last as long, last as long than that of an adult of an adult. Um, the airway and respiratory tract is the conduit that allows air to move from the atmosphere and into the alveoli like for gas exchange. No matter what the patient's condition, the airway must always remain intact and patent. Um, any obstruction of the airway results in less air movement, which thus leads to some degree of poor gas exchange and potential like hypoxia, whether that obstruction is due to vomit, blood, food, or swelling. The degree of the obstruction directly affects the amount of air available for gas exchange. The tongue may create only a partial area obstruction, whereas a piece of food may completely stop airflow. The airway can also become obstructed for injuries such as burns and soft tissue trauma to the face and upper airway. Why is my clicker showing up? There we go. My computer's freezing. I'll bear with me. I'm having some technical issues. Let's try this again. All right, it's not gonna work for me. Anyways, uh, if you look at table 10-1 in your book, um, it goes over some way signs of an open airway. Uh, air should be able to move in and out easily. Patients should be able to speak in full sentences and the sound of the voice should be normal for the patient. Whereas in a blocked or inadequate airway, there's gonna be some, t there's usually some type of sounds or they're unable to speak. Um, in the upper airway, you may have strider or gurgling. In the lower airway, you may have um, some other sounds as well. 
there might be swelling to the mouth or oropharynx. That's why you want to make sure you do a full assessment. Snoring or sonorous sounds occurs when the upper airway is partially obstructed by the tongue or by relaxed tissues within the pharynx. The snoring and obstruction can be corrected by performing a head tilt chin lift. In a patient with a suspected spinal injury, a jaw thrust maneuver should be used. Crowing is a sound like a crow cawing that occurs when the muscles around the larynx spasm and narrow the openings into the trachea. Air rushing through the restricted passage causes the sound. Gurgling, which is a sound, sounds like gargling, like when you gargle water while you're brushing your teeth, usually indicates the presence of flood, blood, vomit, or some type of secretion uh, within the airway. If you hear this, you want to immediately suction the substance from their airway. Strider is a harsh, high-pitched sound heard during inspiration. It is characteristic of a significant upper airway obstruction from swelling in the larynx. Strider may also be heard if a mechanical obstruction by food or other object is present. When you need to open the mouth of an unresponsive patient, you have to you need to make sure that you're doing it properly for the correct technique. When opening the mouth, you want to kneel above or behind the patient. You want to cross the thumb and forefinger of one hand. Place the thumb on the patient's lower teeth and your forefinger on the upper incisors or teeth. And using a scissors motion, or almost like you're trying to snap your fingers, move, twi move your fingers in that motion to open the mouth. That way, in case the patient snaps their mouth shut, your fingers will pop out. When doing this, you want to inspect inside the teeth for vomit, blood, or any broken teeth or foreign bodies that could have potentially obstruct the airway. Any foreign substance that you see, you want to go ahead and suction them at this time out of the mouth. Alright guys, we're going to take a break here. Um, when we pick up, we will go over some ways that we open our airway. I'll take a break, stretch your legs, get something to drink, whatever you need to do.